I like them, everybody. We'll get started now. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Praise belongs to Allah. We praise him and we ask him for uh, guidance and forgiveness. We seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our actions. Whomever Allah guides, no one can lead them astray. And whom he makes astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah alone with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the servant and messenger of Allah. You who believe, be mindful of God, as is his due, and make sure you devote yourselves to him to your dying moment. Believers, be mindful of God. Speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose, and he will put your deeds right for you and forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys God and his messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. So again, it's not like I'm dear sisters and brothers. Always grateful to be here sharing a Friday afternoon with you all, <clears throat> especially when we do so for our own spiritual benefit and for the sake of Allah. So um, we're going to continue the story of Musa -Islam, from where we left off last time. So this is uh, part four of the Musa story. Um, and again, the purpose is to tie some of the relevance in our in the story to our own current lives. Um, and so as I mentioned before, you know, there are so many lessons for us in the story of Musa. Um, and as a reminder, I'm primarily sharing the story of Musa from both the Quran, in which I'll indicate which chapter and which verses are being quoted, and also from a source that offers some additional details, um, many of which you, you probably have already heard. So where we left off last time is that Musa has arrived uh, to Midian after running away from the Egyptian authorities. There he was helped by two sisters. Well, actually, no, there he was. First, he was helped, he helped the two sisters water their flock of sheep, and then they invited him to meet their father. The father offered him a proposal that included marriage to one of his daughters uh, and safety uh, in return for years of service and work. Uh, Musa, so Musa marries one of the women he initially helped at the water hole and spent the next 10 years working with her father and raising his own family. His new life was quiet and contemplative. He did not have to endure the intrigue of the Egyptian court or the humiliation of his people, the children of Israel. Musa was able to ponder the, one, the wonders of God and the universe. Any account uh, of Musa's life is filled with lessons and guidance for Musa and for humankind. Right? God put Musa through experiences that would hold him in good steed in his coming mission, which we're going to get into next time. But, um, you know, as we know, Musa had been brought up in the house of Pharaoh of Egypt. Therefore, he was well aware of the politics and intrigue of the Egyptian government. Musa also had firsthand experience of the corruption of Pharaoh himself, a man who had declared himself God. And it was through God's grace and mercy that Musa was able to escape from Egypt and travel about in the lands. He was able to experience the diversity of other cultures and people. You know, we know travel both then and now broadens horizons, opens hearts and minds to the differences and the similarities between people of diverse background. Right? Allah says in the in the Quran, Surah Hujarat, verse 13, O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another. So during his time in Midian, Musa was a shepherd, right? Um, and Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him informed us that all of the prophets of God had spent some time flocking, uh, sorry, some time tending flocks of sheep. Um, it may have seemed uh, like the same strange profession, but on careful examinations, we can see that shepherds learn valuable lessons while tending to their flocks. A shepherd has a very lonely and quiet life. So there's time for personal reflection and contemplation of the wonders of life. However, on a micro level, right, a shepherd must be constantly on alert for danger. You know, we know sheep are very weak animals and they require constant care and attention. If one sheep wanders away from the protection of the flock, it's going to become easy prey. And then on a macro level, a prophet usually has a job of protecting a whole nation. Um, they must be alert and aware of any danger threatening their followers, um, especially the weak, the poor, and, and the oppressed among them. So after Musa had um, completed his term of service that he had pledged to his father-in-law, he was overcome with homesickness. He began to miss his family in the land of Egypt. And even though he was afraid of what would happen if he returned, he experienced a strange longing to return to the land of his birth. 
So Musa gathered his family together and began that long journey back to Egypt. So we're going to return now to uh, the Quran, Surah uh, Qasas. So we left off with verse um, 28. Now we're continuing with verse 29. So verse 29 says, One, Once Musa had fulfilled the term and was traveling with his family, he caught sight of a fire on the side of a mountain and said to his family, Wait, I have seen a fire. I will bring you news from there or a burning stick for you to warm yourselves. So while Musa was trekking back across the desert, right? He's heading back to Egypt. He got lost and it was cold and it was a cold and dark night. Musa saw what appeared to be a fire burning in the distance, which would be the clue that there was some people there. So he told his family to stay where they were. And he had hopes of either, you know, getting some directions or being able to carry some fire back to warm his family. Unbeknownst to Musa, he was about to participate in one of history's most amazing conversations. He walked, he walked towards the fire, and as he did, he heard a voice. Okay, in Surah Qasas, verse 30, Allah says, But when he reached it, a voice called out to him from the right-hand side of the valley, from a tree on the blessed ground, Moses, I am God, the Lord of the worlds. Allah also says in Surah Al-Namal, verses 8 and 9, blessed is whoever is in the fire and who whosoever is round about it. And far removed from God, from every imperfection, the Lord of all that exists. O Musa, verily, it is I, God, the Almighty, the All-Wise. So in multiple verses in the Quran, Allah clearly says that he spoke to Musa. And he asked Musa to remove his shoes, for he was standing on sacred ground. God revealed to Musa that he has been chosen for a special mission and bid him listen to what was about to be said. So Allah says in uh, chapter 20, verses 14 through 16, Surah Taha, I am God, there is no God but, but me. So worship me and keep up the prayer so that you remember me. The hour is coming, though I choose to keep it hidden. For each soul will be rewarded for its labor. Do not let anyone who does not believe in it and follow his own desires distract you from it. And so bring you to ruin. So this is a direct conversation between God and, and Musa. Here where prayer and worship was prescribed upon Musa and his followers. Just as prayer was also prescribed upon the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his followers in much the same way on the night of the Prophet Muhammad's journey to Jerusalem and ascent into the heavens. So at this time, Musa must have been uh, mesmerized or frightened or a little bit of both. He had become lost in the dark and was cold and was searching for light and guidance. He walked towards what he thought was a burning fire and found the light and guidance of God. Musa was holding a stick in, or like a staff in his hand and God spoke to him and said, what is this stick, Musa? Tell me about it. Musa answers, again, this is from, from Surah Taha. This is my stick whereon I lean and wherewith I beat down branches for my sheep and wherein I find other uses. Musa knew this stick very well. He knew that it had no miraculous qualities. God asked Musa to throw the stick to the ground, and when he did, it began, it began to slither and shake. The stick had been transformed into a snake. So obviously this would frighten Musa, and he turned on his heels and began to run away. It's a natural human inclination to be afraid of strange and unknown things, but God wanted to remove this fear from Musa's heart. He was about to embark on a difficult mission. And it was important that he began to, to complete, he, he be, that he begin with complete trust that God would protect him, knowing that there is absolutely no reason for him to be fearful. So Allah reminds him, and this is now back to, so these verses are repeated in multiple surahs. So going back to Surah Qasas, verse 31, Allah says, and throw your stick. But when he saw it moving as if it were a snake, he turned in flight and looked not back. It was said, O Musa, draw near and fear not. Verily, you are those who are secure. So then God instructed Musa to put his hand in his cloak. He revealed to him another sign of this magnificent and omnipotent, so, uh, omnipotent signs, which Musa would need in his coming mission, proof to those who are disobedient and rebellious. Allah says, uh, insert your hand into the opening of your garment and it will come out white without disease and draw your hand close to your side to be free from fear. The same fear that you had suffered from the snake. And also by that, your hand will return to its original state. These are two signs 
from your Lord to Pharaoh and his chiefs. Verily, they are the people who are rebellious and disobedient towards God. So God intended to send Musa to Pharaoh, a man he feared most. And Musa thought that Pharaoh would surely put him to death. His heart constricted on fear, but God reassured him. Okay, so this is the part of the story that, that we're going to stop today. Um, and we'll reflect on a few things here. I say the saying of mine and seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims who ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. Bismillah. In the name of Allah and exaltations be to Allah and blessings and peace be upon the messenger of Allah. So there's a lot in this story that we could focus on, okay? But I want to talk about Musa. What we kind of, what was mentioned in the beginning is that Musa as the shepherd. So we know that Musa obviously had to flee Egypt for his own safety. And how did he live in Egypt? He lived as a prince, right? He lived surrounded by people, but he had to leave for his own safety. Um, but by doing so, he was able to not only escape his own danger, but he also escaped the witnessing of the oppression and humiliation of his people, right? He didn't have to witness, now, now that he's in Midian, he doesn't have to witness the brutality of Pharaoh against the children of Israel. And this gap in connection, right, physical connection, allowed him to accept an opportunity offered by the father-in-law, right? That gave him autonomy, freedom, family. He, got, you know, he gained a family, um, personal responsibility, and also time to contemplate, right? If he's the shepherd and he's out there alone. So similarly, we see in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that uh, before Allah sent the angel Jibreel with the message of the Quran, Muhammad would often and regularly retreat to moments of solitude to contemplate. And it's probably safe to assume that this practice was first developed when he was a young boy tending to the flock of livestock and when he lived with Halima and her family in the desert as a small child. Throughout his life, he would take time to retreat from life um, and, and all that came with it, right? This everyday life and, and all of the things that you are sort of surrounded by. But he would take time to separate himself and reflect on his existence. You know, he would... He would zoom out uh, from the focus of this life and zoom in on the focus of God and his purpose on earth. Um, you know, there were oftentimes there were instances that made him uncomfortable, but he didn't know how to change it. Oftentimes he felt that he didn't fully belong in his society. This is the prophet Muhammad or so on. But he knew that he belonged somewhere. He wanted to create change and change in a way that was impactful and meaningful. What, you know, what he was maybe questioning, was this his role to play? Was this his responsibility? How could he spread goodness and justice in a society that was littered with injustice and oppression? He was just one person, just as Musa was just one person. And just as you and I, we are each just one person. You know, Allah tells us in Surah Baqarah, verse 30, that when he created humankind, the angels questioned him. All right, the verse reads, and mention, O Muhammad, when your Lord said to the angels, indeed, I will make upon the earth a successive authority. And they said, will you place upon it one who causes corruption therein and sheds blood while we exalt you with praise and declare your perfection? Allah said, indeed, I, not, I know that which you do not. Now, we will never, we can never say definitively, exactly what Allah meant when he said, indeed, I know that which you do not know. But it does tell us that Allah had a reason for creating people who will, you know, who some will cause corruption and, and shed blood. Now, I know we see a lot of oppression and injustice, especially, you know, when it's against kind of our own people um, or done with our own financial support. Um, this is very difficult for us to deal with. And it's difficult not to let us let it consume us. You know, for many of us, if not all of us, the past nine months have been a severe test in this arena. Unlike anything that we've really seen, you know, maybe some of us have seen in our lifetime, but no, I don't think any of us have really witnessed what we're witnessing 
the way that we have in our lifetime, right? We are witnessing a genocide and ethnic cleansing that is live and in real time. Never before have we really seen this. And unfortunately, it seems like as if there's no end in sight or at least an end that will be one of fairness. We are constantly consuming misery, corruption, bloodshed, in mass amounts. And it has had a toll. It's taken a toll on pretty much all of us to some degree. Um, however, if we look at the story of Musa, what can we draw from that? We can see that there is an importance of taking time to remove yourself and possibly redirect where your focus is. If we can imagine what the prophets Musa and Muhammad endured while they watched their own people suffering, right? I mean, this would be hard for us to really imagine. What we're seeing is, is extreme, but what they saw is even more extreme. You know, it's really impossible to measure the amount of patience that they and, and all prophets um, had to have during their lives. Yet, they were given opportunities where they employed the tactic of removal and contemplation. They saw the value of removing oneself from scenarios that would cause stress and despair. Uh, you know, I would call this a prophetic value, both in, in an, as an attribute of their character and uh, a virtue that we should all strive to employ. So if we were to utilize the practice of removal or solitude and contemplation, we can not only energize or re-energize ourselves to fight the good fight, but also gain a more broad and deeper understanding of what is going on. Sometimes you just need to turn it off and take a break, right? By it, I'm talking about, you know, the nonstop in your face news or discussion or conversation, social media content that is just filled with contention and rage and misery. You know, it, obviously those things can ignite change. It can ignite you to call for change, to work for change. But there's also a downside, right? When we are so consumed with things that are miserable and feel just impossible to affect, um, that feeling of hopelessness, right? It'll create a feeling of hopelessness. And that feeling and that rage will seep into all areas of our lives. I mean, this is just how we are wired. We can't be so stoic and, and walled off that we can watch these things, see these things, witness these, these, these horrible things and it not affect us. We have to stop and think, what is our purpose on life? If it is to be a source of justice in a world that is filled with injustice, what do we do to ensure that we can work towards that? You know, we all have a role to play. Those that are suffering a misery that we can not even begin to contemplate right? That is a role that Allah has placed them in. That is not a role that Allah has placed us in. We have a role to play. Everyone has a role to play, but that role may not be the same for everyone. So we have an opportunity to do what those in Gaza, those in Sudan, those in Congo, those in China, those in Burma are, don't have, right? We can pull back and contemplate. We can pull back and think and have, you know, have a moment of introspection that we can try to figure out a strategy to approach this. Sometimes you just have to step back to see the bigger picture and, and determine what role or what is your, your purpose. As a reminder, you know, living life, our, you know, our experience, our lived experience, and, and that may include, you know, a fight for justice. Those things are not linear. There's not just one way to live life. There's not just one way to fight for justice. There are multiple routes. There are detours. There are moments when the roads will convene and merge into a wider road. And other times when it veers off into a small, you know, like a small rural lane in the middle of nowhere. All of those paths have a purpose and it is perfectly okay to venture on different paths at different time. Maybe you're on a multi-lane highway. Maybe you're like, I don't know, what is it? I-10 in Houston and it's a bazillion lanes. And sometimes you're just on a road that doesn't even have a name, but you're all headed to the same place, right? You're all headed towards God. You're all headed on paths that are filled with justice and fairness. So it's, it's, my, it's, it's important to recognize that 
there are many ways to achieve the same goal. Additionally, you know, when you have your self-defined responsibility, you can't drag others into it, right? They may not be there. They may not be on that same path as you, and they may have, you know, have a different understanding at, at a given time. It is not your responsibility to drag others to where you are. Additionally, you can't guilt others into seeing the situation as you see it. You have to think there's no way any one of us is so omnipotent that we could possibly understand and see the truths in all things at once. So we cannot guilt others into, in, you know, and accusing them of things because they're not at the same path as you are. I mean, I'm being sort of vague, but I think you all have witnessed things that you could say, you know, I, I've, I've seen this. I've seen people guilt others into, um, you know, attempting to guilt others into coming on board with them or behaving in the same way they are because they think their one way is the right way. So we must remember that justice comes in many forms. And we all have different powers that can be directed towards justice. But it's that diversity that is the greatest tool that humans have. There is diversity in humans. There is diversity in solutions. The most important thing is that we recognize that diversity. We, we use our ability to come together and sort of merge forces. You know, you, you see like, what am I thinking? Like the, the Power Rangers, right? Each, each one had a different power. Well, they were the strongest when they came together and not one said, oh, I'm water power and you must be water power. I don't, I don't even know what their powers were, but the point is you, you wanna bring together forces that are diverse as an effective way to create change. So call it meditation, call it a mental retreat, a, an escape from the real world, whatever you, whatever you want to label it, it has value, right? And I will repeat, it has prophetic value. These verses and stories of the Quran are, are multi-layered and rich with meanings. This is simply what I took from this segment of the story of Musa, right? I pulled from it contemplation, moments to retreat and, and have some uh, introspection. Now, you could have read this part of the story and gained a completely different understanding. But this is just what I wanted to focus on today. Allah, please accept our good deeds and our good intentions and forgive our shortcomings and missteps and allow us to come together and share more moments together. Allah, grant us the good things in this world and the good things in the next life and save us from the punishment of the fire. O Allah, aid us in accepting the tests and tribulations of this life and give us the strength to overcome any challenge we may face. O Allah, we ask that you place peace and solace in the hearts of those who are suffering any injustice. O Allah, make us a community who treats one another with dignity and respect and acceptance and values the diversity we have. O Allah, we hope for your mercy. Do not leave us to ourselves, even for the blinking of an eye. Correct each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. If I have said anything of truth, that is from Allah alone, and my gratitude goes to Allah. And if I if I have said anything that was not of truth, then that is from my own ego, and I ask for forgiveness for that transgression. Amen. <laughs>